Hello. In this lecture, uh, I will again go back to the correlation function g of rt, whose double Fourier transform over time and momentum uh, momentum gives me the sq omega, the scattering law that I tend to measure in an experiment. I will try to familiarize you with g of rt and its physical significance and also since s of q omega and g of rt are Fourier space of each other, I will also introduce you to the design requirements of spectrometers depending on the kind of dynamics or kind of structure that you want to see because you need to decide it beforehand and that will dictate how the detects are positioned, how energies are measured, everything. So, and then I will take you through a tour in the various uh, neutron sources, major and our own source and various components that are present in a neutron scattering setup starting right from the source to the detector I will take up all these description of all these of course a little briefly to introduce you to the proper experimental facilities now I go over to the lecture so this lecture so as I said I will discuss the physical significance of the correlation function I will also discuss the design of experiments versus resolution and then I will introduce you to elements of scattering setups, the source, the beam transportation, the beam monochromatization, two neutron detectors. I will touch upon all of them briefly, if not in this lecture, then in the next lecture. So. I had indicated that S of Q omega is a double Fourier transform of G of RT. So D3R e to the power IQ dot R is one integration over space that takes me to the Q space and DT e to the power minus I omega T over time that takes me to the omega space. So I measure instruments in which specifically I measure neutrons at a certain angle and if it's a attempt to understand dynamics then I also try to find out what is the energy of the neutron because the dynamical process in a system like phonons, diffusion, molecular vibrations, they can exchange energy with the neutrons. Why it is not possible with X-rays is the fact that if I take a one angstrom X-ray, the energy is about 10 kilo electron volts. So, uh, the, to measure the change of milli electron volt on a kilo electron volt X-ray is difficult, if not impossible. Actually, presently in synchrotron sources using very high resolution backscattering instruments, one can measure energy transfers even of that order. But in general, I can broadly tell you that the energy transfer of milli electron to measure using a photon of kilo electron volt is like measure trying to measure a millivolt uh, change in voltage using a volt voltmeter which is calibrated for mega electron volt uh, mega volt uh, measurements so now let's come to the correlation function which describes the time space correlation between the scattering units I mentioned this, consider a wave, phonon is a wave, the position of one particle at time t allows me to predict the position of another particle at time t prime. Let me just tell you. We know that if there is a chain of atoms, let us just take a linear chain of atoms in a system. I know if there is a phonon, then the phonon possibly goes like this, the phonon, that means 
the displacement of this is correlated with the displacement of this particle. It is also correlated to the displacement of this particle and this particle. So at any instant t, if I know the position of this particle r, or I call r comma t, that's more conventional. Then position of all other particles at any other position any other position r prime at a time t prime is known for a phonon so that means this phonon dispersion relation gives me g of rt for this system now coming back to static system If I consider g of classical rt, now at t equal to 0 if I consider, this has got two parts because this is the sum of delta functions r0 minus rjt. Now at, I sum over all the partners and do a, this is an ensemble averaging. The ensemble average is inherent because as I told you earlier, when I do a measurement, I do it over finite time. That means I take frame after frame after frame onto the detector and that does the ensemble averaging automatically. So this ensemble average is shown by the brackets as I shown here. Now this has two parts. A particle, of course, it's in, in its own location it will have a delta r, but then for all other partners of it, there is delta, delta function peaks whenever rj minus r0 hits another atom. So let me again the same chain of atoms in the static thing. I have got this chain of atoms, I have this chain of atoms. This means one, it has got a delta function at the origin and any particle can be the origin. So it's a delta r for this for all the particles, but also whenever the distance, this distance, this is the, let us call it the, this is the jth particle, jth particle, jth. So whenever the distance is such that there is a particle there, I have got a delta function peak. And this delta function peak gives me not only the delta r I have got, Plus, I have got a pair correlation function g of r. What do you mean by pair correlation function? And these are ensemble average. Uh, a simplest example, suppose I take a case of molten sodium chloride. I am taking a simple example. So there are Na plus and Cl minus ions. At any instant of time, if I look at this molten salt, if I take a sodium, I can assure you, statistically, they are surrounded by a circle of chlorium minus because they are ions and they attract each other. And then surrounded by the chlorine ions, we will have maybe possibly another shell of sodium ions statistically. So this shell compared to this shell is more clearly defined as you go farther and farther. The, these shells that I am showing you they get diffuse and more diffuse and finally I have constant density. So starting with one sodium as origin, I have got a pair correlation function which will possibly look something like this. So I have got a peak, this delta function peak here which I am not plotting. Now the pair correlation function should, should have a peak, then smaller peak and then it will continue. So I have got a first, in the first shell, I have got a peak, if call it R0, then whenever delta R, R minus R, R equal to R0, I have this shell and I will have a peak. And this is actually later when I discuss the, the structure of liquid and amorphous systems, it will come naturally 
I'll introduce you to it more in more details at that time. But what I mean is that in a in a static system, in a crystallic syst crystalline system, you have got sharp delta function peaks. But doesn't mean that when we have a liquid or amorphous system, there are no peaks. They are diffuse, but they are very clear, short range order in such systems and that can be found out from the G of R that we can measure in an experiment. But G of R, I have taken out time, so I am not doing now in, for this experiment. This is not a dynamics targeted experiment. We are trying to look at the structure. So this is, uh, if I may say, a brief introduction to G of R or pair correlation function for a static case and for a dynamic case as I told you that given a phonon, an acoustic phonon, a transverse acoustic phonon which I was drawing for you, transverse acoustic phonon, then uh, the displacement of all the particles are correlated and their G of RT is also well known. So we can find out S of Q omega for this also. This is a dynamics case, the dynamic case. So with this, I have introduced you to G of RT and uh, for a static case and for a dynamic case. Now I will come to resolution of an experiment and what can I do about it. So because Q omega and RT, so Q and R, Q is basically momentum transfer, H cross Q is the momentum transfer. So it's a, mo it's a momentum space and R is real space and they are related, we know by the uncertainty relation, delta P delta R should be of the order of H cross and or higher than, greater than equal to H cross. Similarly, the energy transfer is H cross omega and energy and time, they are also have an uh, uncertainty relation because they are Fourier uh, inverse of each other in this expression. So delta A delta T should be greater than or equal to H cross or of the order at the best. The, now in an experiment, the delta K is basically the range of momentum transfer that we measure in the experiment because that gives me the limit of uh, momentum transfer or moment and then that is the gives me the limit of uncertainty for a given system and that tells me twice pi by h should tell me that how much is the quantum mechanical space resolution that I can achieve. Let me be a little more specific. So we need to design or choose the experiment depending on what you want to see. So let me just uh, write that for a diffraction experiment let us say the quantum mechanical quantum mechanics says the resolution in an experiment is 2 pi by q max 0 to q max is my measurement range and q max again let me go back to the board we know that q is equal to 4 i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry hmm. 4 4 pi by lambda sin theta when the actually the beam has deviated by 2 theta so half of that is sin theta and this is q is equal to 4 pi by lambda sin theta this comes from a very simple geometry this is k1 k1 kya ho raha hai acha thread you are seeing this is k2 outgoing this is your q vector if this is equal to this is 2 theta and the wave vector q is 4 pi by lambda sin theta. 
So for then I know when I say Q max, Q max, it is proportional to theta. Of how much theta I am covering in an experiment, theta max. If I am doing the if, if lambda equal to constant. I make this comment over here because from this expression you can see I can, I can also change the Q by changing lambda. I can go to smaller and smaller lambda and Q will become larger and larger and that's what is done in pulse spallation neutron sources but that will come later. What I mean is that here in an angle dispersive experiment your Q max depends on the maximum angle of the experiment. Then I can evaluate. Let us say I want to go for a wave vector transfer of 10 angstrom inverse with 1.2 angstrom incident neutrons. One needs to go to scattering angles of around 140 degree, 2 theta equal to 140 degree. In a typical powder diffractometer, we have 10 to 12 angstrom inverse range. So you can see that we have to have detector moving from 0 to 140 degree. And this gives me a quantum resolution of 0 0.6 angstrom for measurement of uh, the lattice parameters and that's reasonable because often lattice parameters are in the range of this. Now suppose I want to broaden the resolution. That means I don't want to see the atomic structure. I want to see some larger conglomerations. So I make my resolution 30 angstrom. This is not improving the resolution. It is making the resolution poorer. Then and I am using let us say a 4 angstrom neutron. All these have meaning later. Why I am using 4 angstrom neutron? Because with a 4 angstrom neutron for uh, having a resolution of 30 angstrom we need to go to about 4 degrees. If I use uh, shorter wavelength neutrons shorter wavelength neutrons then to go to this kind of smaller Q values a theta also has to be much smaller. You can see that in that ex expression I wrote theta equal to 4 degree. Now you have a direct beam and you have to measure up to 4 degree which is a, sorry two. So if I need to go to 4 degree is a reasonably small angle 4 degree. If we have to go to 1 degree let us say 1 degree because I want to go to 0 0.2 angstrom inverse using a shorter wavelength neutron then such small angles are difficult because you also have a direct beam which has got a beam width of certain angular spread and the direct beam might start getting into this so that's why I said that I will be using 4 angstrom neutrons and that's called a cold neutron. I will tell you how to how we get cold neutrons and uh, so we have to go to 4 degree. So this one the top one the yellow rectangle this is a typical test for a powder diffractometer for crystallographic structure where we are going up to a wave vector transfer of 10 angstrom inverse. Similarly for a resolution of 30 angstrom other way around we need to go to 0.2 angstrom inverse. Look at the difference 10 angstrom inverse 0 0.2 angstrom inverse. With a 4 angstrom neutron we need to go to an angle of around 4 degrees. So this is an example that I have taken which is a typical small angle neutron scattering or SANS case. Here we don't see the medium as consisting of atoms and crystal crystallographic lattice but we are looking at conglomerations which may be 30 angstrom sometimes it can be even large 100 angstrom 200 angstroms and 
these are inhomogeneities in a system that we can be studying. So the need of what we want to see dictates the spectrometer. So, and we have to design the spectrometer, various spectrometers, depending on this need. So, I will come back to this in the next part of the talk, the what we can see with neutrons in condensed matter.